Tinder's the Night by F. Scott Fitzgerald Book 2, Chapter 3 About a year and a half before, Dr. Dolmer had some vague correspondence with an American gentleman living in Luzon, a Mr. Devereux Warren of the Warren family of Chicago. A meeting was arranged, and one day Mr. Warren arrived at the clinic with his daughter Nicole, a girl of 16. She was obviously not well, and the nurse who was with her took her to walk about the grounds while Mr. Warren had his consultation. Warren was a strikingly handsome man, looking less than 40. He was a fine American type in every way, tall, broad, well-made, an homme très chic, as Dr. Dommler described him to France. His large gray eyes were sunbeamed from rowing on Lake Geneva, and he had that special air about him of having known the best of the world. The conversation was in German, for it developed that he had been educated at Göttingen. He was nervous and obviously very moved by his errand. Dr. Dommler, my daughter isn't right in the head. I've had lots of specialists and nurses for her, and she's taken a couple of rest cures, but the thing has grown too big for me, and I've been strongly recommended to come to you. Very well, said Dr. Dommler. Suppose you start at the beginning and tell me everything. There isn't any beginning. There isn't any insanity in the family that I know of on either side. Nicole's mother died when she was 11, and I've sort of been father and mother both to her with the help of governesses. Father and mother both to her. He was very moved as he said this. Dr. Domler saw that there were tears in the corners of his eyes and noticed for the first time that there was whiskey on his breath. As a child, she was a darling thing. Everyone was crazy about her, everybody that came in contact with her. She was smart as a whip and happy as the day is long. She liked to read or draw or dance or play the piano, anything. I used to hear my wife say she was the only one of our children who never cried at night. I've got an older girl, too, and there was a boy that died, but Nicole was... Nicole... Was Nicole... He broke off, and Dr. Dolmler helped him. She was a perfectly normal, bright, happy child. Perfectly. Dr. Dumbler waited. Mr. Warren shook his head, blew a long sigh, glanced quickly at Dr. Dumbler, and then at the floor again. About eight months ago, or maybe it was six months ago, or maybe ten, I tried to figure, but I can't remember exactly where we were when she began to do funny things, crazy things. Her sister was the first to say anything to me about it because Nicole was always the same to me. He added rather hastily, as if someone had accused him of being to blame. The same loving little girl. The first thing was about a valet. Oh, yes, said Dr. Dommler, nodding his venerable head, as if like Sherlock Holmes he had expected a valet, and only a valet to be introduced at this point. I had a valet, been with me for years, Swiss, by the way. He looked up for the doctor's patriotic approval, and she got some crazy idea about him. She thought he was making up to her. Of course, at the time, I believed her, and I let him go, but I know now it was all nonsense. What did she claim he had done? 
That was the first thing. The doctors couldn't pin her down. She just looked at them as if they ought to know what he'd done, but she certainly meant he'd made some kind of indecent advances to her. She didn't leave us in any doubt of that. I see. Of course, I've read about women getting lonesome and thinking there's a man under the bed and all that, but why should Nicole get such an idea? She could have all the young men she wanted. We were in Lake Forest. That's a summer place near Chicago where we have a place, and she was out all day playing golf or tennis with boys, and some of them pretty gone on her at that. All the time Warren was talking to the dried old package of Dr. Domler, one section of the latter's mind kept thinking intermittently of Chicago. Once in his youth, he could have gone to Chicago as fellow and docent at the university and perhaps become rich there and owned his own clinic instead of being only a minor shareholder in a clinic. But when he had thought of what he had considered his own thin knowledge spread over that whole area, over all those wheat fields, those endless prairies. He had decided against it. But he had read about Chicago in those days, about the great feudal families of Armour, Palmer, Field, Crane, Warren, Swift, and McCormick, and many others. And since that time, not a few patients had come to him from that stratum of Chicago and New York. She got worse, continued Warren. She had a fit or something. The things she said got crazier and crazier. Her sister wrote some of them down. He handed a much folded piece of paper to the doctor. Almost always about men going to attack her. Men she knew, or men on the street, anybody. He told of their alarm and distress, of the horrors families go through under such circumstances, of the ineffectual efforts they had made in America, finally of the faith in a change of scene that had made him run the submarine blockade and bring his daughter to Switzerland. On a United States cruiser, he specified with a touch of hauteur. It was possible for me to arrange that by a stroke of luck. And, may I add, he smiled apologetically, that, as they say, money is no object. Certainly not, agreed Domler, dryly. He was wondering why, and what about the man was lying to him? Or if he was wrong about that, what was the falsity that pervaded the whole room, the handsome figure in tweeds, sprawling in his chair with a sportsman's ease? That was a tragedy out there in the February day. The young bird with wings crushed somehow, and inside here it was all too thin, thin and wrong. I would like to talk to her a few minutes now, said Dr. Donler, going into English as if it would bring him closer to Warren. Afterward, when Warren had left his daughter and returned to Lausanne, and several days had passed, the doctor and Franz entered upon Nicole's card. Diagnostic. Schizophrenie. Phase agu en décroissance. La peau des hommes est un symptôme de la maladie et n'est point constitutionnel. Le pronostic doit rester récivé. Diagnosis, divided personality, acute and downhill phase of the illness. The fear of men is a symptom of the illness and is not at all constitutional. The prognosis must be reserved. And then they waited with increasing interest as the days passed for Mr. Warren's promised second visit. It was slow in coming. After a fortnight, Dr. Domler wrote. Confronted with further silence, he committed what was for those days une 
folie and telephoned the Grand Hotel at Vevy. He learned from Mr. Warren's valet that he was at the moment packing to sail for America, but reminded the forty francs Swiss, for the call would show up on the clinic books, the blood of the Tuileries guard rose to Dr. Daumler's aid, and Mr. Warren was got to the phone. It is absolutely necessary that you come. Your daughter's health all depends. I can take no responsibility. But look here, doctor. That's just what you're for. I have a hurry call to go home. Dr. Daumler had never yet spoken to anyone so far away, but he dispatched his ultimatum so firmly into the phone that the agonized American on the other end yielded. Half an hour after the second arrival, under Zurich Sea, Warren had broken down, his fine shoulders shaking with awful sobs inside his easy-fitting coat, his eyes redder than the very sun on Lake Geneva, and they had an awful story. It just happened, he said hoarsely. I, I don't know, I, I don't know. After her mother died, when she was little, she used to come into my bed every morning. Sometimes she'd sleep in my bed. I was sorry for the little thing. <sighs> After that, whenever we went places in an automobile or a train, we used to hold hands. She used to sing to me. We used to say, now let's not pay any attention to anybody else this afternoon. Let's just have each other. For this morning, you're mine. A broken sarcasm came into his voice. <laughs> People used to say what a wonderful father and daughter we were. They used to wipe their eyes. We were just like lovers. And then, all at once, we were lovers. And ten minutes after it happened, I could have shot myself, except I guess I'm a goddamn degenerate. I didn't have the nerve to do it. And then What? said Dr. Daumler, thinking again of Chicago, and of a mild, pale gentleman with a pince-nez who had looked him over in Zurich thirty years before. Did this thing go on? Oh, no, she almost... She seems to freeze up right away, she just said. Never mind, never mind, Daddy. It doesn't matter, never mind. There were no consequences? No. He gave one short, convulsive sob and blew his nose several times, except now there are plenty of consequences. As the story concluded, Daumler sat back in the focal chair of the middle class and said to himself sharply, Peasant! It was one of the few absolute worldly judgments that he had permitted himself for twenty years. Then he said, I would like for you to come to a hotel in Zurich and spend the night and come see me in the morning. And then what? Dr. Daumler spread his hands wide enough to carry a young pig. Chicago? He suggested. Four. Then we knew where we stood, said Franz. Daumler told Warren he would take the case if he would agree to keep away from his daughter indefinitely, with an absolute minimum of five years. After Warren's first collapse, he seemed chiefly concerned as to whether the story would ever leak back to America. We mapped out the routine for her and waited. The prognosis was bad, as you know. The percentage of cures, even so, such a cures, is very low at that age. Those first letters look bad, agreed Dick. Very bad. Very typical. I hesitated about letting the first one get out of the clinic. Then I thought it would be good for Dick to know we're carrying on here. It was generous of you to answer them. Dick sighed. <sighs> she was such a pretty thing. She enclosed a lot of snapshots of herself. And for a month there, I didn't have anything to do. All I said in my letters was, be a good girl and mind the doctors. That was enough. It gave her somebody to think of outside, 
For a while, she didn't have anybody, only one sister that she didn't seem very close to. Besides, reading her letters helped us here. They were a measure of her condition. I'm glad. You see, now, what happened? She felt complicity. That's neither here nor there, except as we want to re value her ultimate stability and strength of character first came this shock then she went off to boarding school and heard the girls talking so from sheer self-protection she developed the idea that she had no complicity and from there it was very easy to slide into a phantom world where all men the more you liked them and trusted them the more evil did she ever go into the horror directly no and, as a matter of fact, when she began to seem normal about October, we were in a predicament. If she had been 30 years old, we would have let her make her own adjustment, but she was so young. We were afraid she might harden with it all twisted inside her. So, Dr. Domler said to her frankly, Your duty now is to yourself. This doesn't by any account mean the end of anything for you. Your life is just at its beginning. And so forth and so forth. She really has an excellent mind. So, he gave her a little Freud to read, not too much. She was very interested. In fact, we made rather a pet of her around here, but she is reticent, he added. He hesitated. We have wondered if, in her recent letters to you, she mailed herself from Zurich. She has anything that would be illuminating about her state of mind and her plans for the future. Dick considered. Hmm, yes and uh, no. I'll bring the letters out here if you want. She seems hopeful and normally hungry for life, even rather romantic. Sometimes she speaks of the past as people speak who have been in prison, but <laughs> you never know whether they refer to the crime or the imprisonment or the whole experience. After all, I'm only a sort of stuffed figure in her life. Of course, I understand your position exactly, and I express our gratitude once again. That was why I wanted to see you before you see her. Dick laughed. You think she's going to make a flying leap at my person? No, not that. But I want to ask you to go very gently. You are attractive to women, Dick. Then <laughs> God help me. Well, I'll be gentle and repulsive. I'll chew garlic whenever I'm going to see her and wear a stubble beard. I'll drive her to cover. Not garlic, said Franz, taking him seriously. You don't want to compromise your career, but you're partly joking. And I can limp a little. And there's no real bathtub where I'm living anyhow. <laughs> you're entirely joking. Franz relaxed, or rather assumed the posture of one relaxed. Now, Tell me about yourself and your plans. I've only got one, Franz, and that's to be a good psychologist. Maybe to be the greatest one that ever lived. Mm -hmm. That's very good and very American, he said. It's more difficult for us. He got up and went to the French window. I stand here and I see a Zurich. There is the steeple of the Grosse Munza. In its vault, my grandfather is buried. Across the bridge from it lies my ancestor Lavater, who would not be buried in any church. Nearby is the statue of another ancestor, Heinrich Pestalozzi, and one of Dr. Alfred Escher. And over everything there is always Zwingli, and I am continually confronted with a pantheon of heroes. Yes, I see. Dick got up. I was only talking big. Everything's just starting over. Most of the Americans in France are fronted to get home, but not me. I draw military pay all the rest of the year if I only attend lectures at the university. How's that for a government on the grand scale that knows its future great men? Then I'm going home for a month and see my father. Then I'm coming back. I've been offered a job. Where? Your rivals. Geisler's Clinic on Interlaken. Don't touch it, 
Franz advised them. They've had a dozen young men there in a year. Guys, is a manic depressive himself. His wife and her lover run the clinic, of course. You understand that's confidential. How about your old scheme for America? Asked Dick lightly. We were going to New York and start an up-to-date establishment for billionaires. That was student's talk. Dick dined with Franz and his bride and a small dog with the smell of burning rubber in their cottage on the edge of the grounds. He felt vaguely oppressed, not by the atmosphere of modest retrenchment, nor by Frau Gregovius, who might have been prophesied, but by the sudden contracting of horizons to which Franz seemed so reconciled. For him, the boundaries of asceticism were differently marked. He could see it as a means to an end, even as a carrying on with the glory it would itself supply, but it was hard to think of deliberately cutting life down to the scale of an inherited suit. The domestic gestures of Franz and his wife, as they turned in a cramped space, lacked grace and adventure. The post-war years in France, the lavish liquidations taking place under the aegis of American splendor, had affected Dick's outlook. Also, men and women had made much of him, and perhaps what had brought him back to the center of the great Swiss watch was an intuition that this was not too good for a serious man. He made Cathy Gregorius feel charming, meanwhile, becoming increasingly restless at the all-pervading cauliflower, simultaneously hating himself, too, for this incipience of he knew not what superficiality. God, am I like the rest after all? So he used to think, starting awake at night. Am I like the rest? This was poor material for a socialist, but good material for those who do much of the world's rarest work. The truth was that for some months he had been going through that partitioning of the things of youth, wherein it is decided whether or not to die for what one no longer believes. In the dead white hours in Zurich, staring into a stranger's pantry, across the upshine of a street lamp, he used to think that he wanted to be good. He wanted to be kind. He wanted to be brave and wise, but mm, it was all pretty difficult. He wanted to be loved, too, if he could fit it in. <laughs>